Good evening to our viewers in India and good morning to those of you who are tuning in from the United States. I know many of you have been waiting for this conversation. The excitement is building up in the US as the countdown really is now kicking in for who's going to be the next president, who's going to be the next vice president. Perhaps this time there has been an extraordinary level of interest in this election because Kamala Harris, the vice presidential nominee for the Democrats, is partly of Indian origin. Her mother was from Tamil Nadu. But she isn't the only partly Indian American in her team. As we've been saying, there's a key Indian American in her team. In fact, the first Indian American to be a press secretary to a vice presidential nominee. And we're talking, of course, about Sabrina Singh. Uh, Sabrina Singh is the press secretary to Kamala Harris. And it is my great pleasure to welcome her uh, to the program today. And uh, like I said, I think this is an election in which there is so much interest uh, here in India, not just in the Indian American community uh, in the US. So uh, welcome, Sabrina. And you know, I, um, I was fascinated by what I read, not just about you, but about your own lineage. And of course, we're going to talk about Senator Harris and we're going to talk about the politics. But I think a lot of people want to know about you. Uh, you're Indian American. Your grandfather was Sardar J. J. Singh, uh, as I read in the Atlantic and as you tweeted, he fought uh, for the rights of Indians to become U.S. citizens. So before we talk about politics, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, tell us about tell us about your granddad. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, you know, it's exciting to join you and uh, you, my morning, your evening. Uh, <laughs> um, it's you know, as you said, the campaign trail is. Uh, getting pretty exciting. I think we have 16 days left uh, as of today, um, but I'm just so excited to be here. Uh, you know, I unfortunately didn't get to meet my grandfather. He passed away um, before I was born, but um, he's certainly someone that um, I think inspired my 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 dad and my uncle and you know my my family generally and and myself certainly. Uh, he you know was a freedom fighter in India during the time of partition, and then. Um, came over to the U.S. and started the India League of America to lobby Congress and to lobby the U.S. government to um, allow Indian citizens to gain access to citizenship. Um, at the time, uh, during the 1940s, that was not something that Indian Americans were allowed. Um, and so he lobbied Congress and, you know, walked the very halls where I got my start when I first moved to Washington, D.C. Um, he was meeting with, uh, you know, members of Congress and senators to advocate for Indian Americans to gain not only citizenship but access to the same, uh, you know, rights and, and principles that you know other Americans had access to, but Indian Americans were shut out from. Um, and so, it's, you know, his story is, is inspiring. I, you know, I wish I had been able to meet him. And I have so many questions um, that I would have loved to have asked him at the time. But um, you know, he's just he's someone I think that um, I have. I not only admire, but it's very big shoes to fill. So um, we we found this one photograph, and obviously this is a slice of history, and I'm just going to pull it out. You'll be able to see it, and I think uh, you'll be able to tell us the story uh, behind this. Uh, this is, you know, Truman signing into law uh, something that made it possible for Indians to get basic rights in the U.S. So talk a little bit about this picture. This photograph actually um, sits on our on my grandfather's old desk in Delhi, um, which I think my uncle now uses as his desk. Um, it is the signing of the Loose Seller Act, which gave Indian Americans um, the right uh, to obtain citizenship within the US. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really um, wonderful photograph. And there's actually another photo, um, I think of my grandfather, it must've been after the signing, but he's holding the pen that the president used to sign the act. And I actually have that hanging um, in my um, house with the, my, my uncle and aunt got it for me. It's a framed photo of my, of my grandfather and then the pen below that the president used to sign um, the act into law. And it's, um, it's nice. It's, you know, it's right uh, sort of when I walk into my house, but it's also a nice reminder of when I'm doing work um, that, you know, just puts things in perspective that this is a, a really long and hard fight um, for so many, not just my grandfather, but so many of those pictured in that photograph and so many of those that are not pictured in that photograph um, that, you know, it, it took, it, 
<laughs> took a lot of time, um, not only for Indian Americans to gain citizenship, but you know, just to be seen and treated equally here in this country. And that that act only allowed, I think, a thousand Indian Americans at a time to to actually gain access to citizenship. Um, and it, what's so interesting is now that I'm thinking about this and telling the story is that I remember uh, my mom going and getting uh, sworn in as a citizen when I was um, young uh, as a, I think I must have been, I, I had to have been in elementary school um, because I remember she was like practicing some of like, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance and, and you know, these were things that I was just saying every day in school. And to think now, like looking back that my mom was able to gain citizenship because of the work that my grandfather had laid, um, you know, years ago, uh, it just, it's sort of a nice full circle that I just <laughs> thought of right now. And what about your parents? From what I read, they did actually decide to take citizenship uh, quite late. It wasn't automatic. It wasn't like your grandfather fought this fight and then your parents automatically decided uh, to take U.S. citizenship. We found one photograph. I think this is uh, you and your dad. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your parents. Yeah, that, well, that's my mom, actually. That's my mom and my dad. That's um, I don't actually remember where that photo is taken but uh so my 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 dad was born in new york so my my grandfather uh when he left india he settled in new york and um there's actually this um really wonderful new yorker uh piece i think from 1945 i want to say um but it's about you know his business that he set up and it was a textile business that he set up in new york and so um he met my grandmother um who was who was a little bit younger than him um and they settled in new york together and had um my uncle and and my dad and um so my my dad was always you know he was born a u.s citizen and then they moved back um i, I think when my dad was about five or seven you know he was young they relocated back to india um to delhi and my mom um you know when my parents decided to move out to los angeles i think you know, they they had gotten married, and they my dad was going to business school out in California. Um, my, my I think my mom only des decided to apply for citizenship. You know, I think in the '90s, um, and I'm not sure what I actually never asked like why why I don't know if it was like she she was waiting or um, if it was just taking a long time to you know to get her the paperwork done. Um, but I remember it was a really proud day for her to have, you know, American citizenship because also, you know, they've lived in the country for so long here um, that this, you know, has become home. So we're actually in Delhi, the city that your parents relocated mm -hmm. to, and we hope uh, to welcome you back here soon. But now see, so much has changed since the time uh, your grandfather fought that fight. But at times, it must feel like nothing changed at all. And the, and what, what I'm bringing up uh, is, of course, um, how Senator Kamala Harris's name uh, was mocked. Um, and I'm just going to play that 10 second clip for anyone who's been living under a rock and missed this. Missed it. The most insidious thing that Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden are trying to perpetrate and Bernie and Elizabeth and Kamala or what Kamala or Kamala, 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 I don't know, whatever. So that was terrible, right? Uh, but the fact is, it's still happening. There is still a kind of entrenched racism against people of color. And of course, you know, the my name is uh, sort of trend has picked up with people hitting back. But when you as an Indian American see this happening to your boss who's running for vice president, who's multicultural, biracial, what is it that you feel? Do you feel like, my God, my grandfather fought this fight and here decades later, there is a fellow American who's making fun of her name and essentially therefore of her ancestry. Well, not just a fellow American, her fellow colleague. I mean, that that yeah. clip was um, Senator David Perdue, um, who's one of our senators from Georgia, who's up for reelection. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I spoke to my boss about it. You know, I had to, I had to show her the clip because it is, of course, her colleague um, that she works with on a, you know, she this is not a colleague that she just met uh, you know, uh, two two weeks ago. This is someone that's been her colleague in the Senate for over three years. And in the Senate, there's only, uh, you know, 100 members. Um, it's pretty easy to get to know people. Um, and, you know, I mean, that was just so insulting and so disgusting. And, you know, it was such a show that he did. I mean, the Republican Party, 
should, I mean, should be embarrassed by that. I don't think anyone apologized. I don't think any Republican member condemned that language from David Perdue. But um, yeah, you know, what's sad is you still see it. And it's not just, you know, Indian Americans, it's Black Americans, it's Latino Americans, um, you know, Asian Americans all across the board. If you have a different sounding name, if you look different, um, you, there's still, you know, many fights that you, that you still have to, uh, you know, work towards and, um, and, and, you know, to be treated equal. And so, um, while I want to say I was, I was surprised, um, I'm not because I mean, look at the president, Donald Trump. I mean, he's, he name calls, he, you know, uses Twitter as a way to basically conduct his, his, uh, political and, and, and personal and uh, basically our government platform is, is through tweets. Um, and so while it's not surprising, um, you know, I think what my grandfather fought for laid the foundation for so many folks um, to, you know, gain access to citizenship, but we know this fight isn't over. Um, and that's why it's, I'm really proud to work for Senator Harris, someone that, you know, is, is black and an Indian American woman. Um, because hopefully, you know, by electing her and Joe Biden, things things begin to change. I will talk about the election in just a moment, but I want you to talk a little bit about how it's been for you being a woman of color. And I emphasize the woman because, as we all know, uh, gender is at the intersection of so many other dimensions, right? And so when you hear a colleague of Senator Harris mocking her name, you as a brown woman, as a woman of color, um, what has been your sort of toughest moment uh, in dealing with this sort of prejudice? And what did Senator Harris feel when she when she actually saw that clip? You know, when I, when she saw the clip, I <laughs> the great thing about her is, you know, it just sort of rolls off. Like she was not surprised and she was like, okay. And just, you know, <laughs> like there's no reaction. Cause like, how do you even dignify that with some type of response, right? Like, it's just so disgusting. Um, so, you know, for me, I think it's been, um, it's been a great experience to be um, her press secretary. And, and I, you know, this cycle, this, this 2020 presidential cycle has been really exciting for me because um, I've gotten to work with, you know, a few other candidates that were running before I actually joined um, the Biden-Harris ticket. But, um, you know, I think something that Senator Harris says and something that I've certainly taken uh, a little bit more to, to heart and sort of internalize more is that um, so often I am the only person in the room that looks like myself. And, and same with Senator Harris, right? She is the only you know, person in the room that really looks like her, and certainly in the Senate, she is the only the um, she is the sec only second Black woman, an Indian American, uh, and first Indian American woman to be elected to the Senate. And so, mm -hmm. you're often in these rooms with um, people to, that don't necessarily look like you. But something that she says that I think is really important to remember is that just because there aren't other people in the room that look like you doesn't mean that you have the full force and support of all the people that came before you and all the people that are working to get into those rooms right behind you. And so that's, that's something that I've really taken to heart because I never thought of it like that. Um, and I never thought of myself as sort of paving the way and I, and I hope I am um, to other people that, you know, want to get involved in political campaigns, um, whether it's, you know, from, from the school board to the Oval Office. Um, you know, I think, I think I'm seeing more Indian Americans certainly involved in campaigns, but there's not that many of us still. And so I'm hoping that um, by by me being, you know, on this campaign today that, you know, I'm sort of uh, helping folks, uh, in inspiring folks to get involved. So, so let me ask you this. I'm going to come to the Harris uh, Biden campaign in a in, in a moment from now. Uh, I I do know you've worked on the Bloomberg campaign, on the Cory Booker campaigns, yeah. and you have worked with Hillary Clinton in the past. Uh, does your name does uh, does your name get mispronounced, or is it relatively uh, is it relatively easy? And what's the one one thing that people have said or uh, commented on, or not understood about you or your your sort of cultural ancestry that really bugs you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, I think what sort of, I think what people don't necessarily realize and have to take a step back on is, is that my worldview is going to be very different from, you know, someone else's worldview. And so, 
Um, I think when you have Indian Americans, Asian Americans in the room, they are coming to the conversation with, you know, their own family backgrounds, uh, you know, the values that they bring to the table. And I think that's something that just, um, you know, it, it, like it's important, I think, that people listen to those opinions and those views when you're having those conversations. And sometimes there are really hard conversations like, you know, how are we reaching the Indian American community on this campaign? How are we reaching, you know, the Latino community on this campaign? And the only way you're going to do that is by having those those people in the room that understand that community. So I think it's just really important to impress upon, you know, people that um, diverse voices make the room better and make the conversation better. Sure. Now, I want to talk a little bit about talking about heritage. There's been a lot of political conversation about Senator Harris's uh, heritage. Uh, we had uh, Donald Trump's son, Eric Trump, saying uh, that Senator Harris hides or underplays uh, the Indian dimension to her. She is, in fact, biracial, and she's always spoken very, very proudly, in fact, as far as I can tell about her mother. Uh, the, she's the daughter of Shamla Gopalan, who was born in Tamil Nadu. I, in fact, interviewed Shamla's brother here in Delhi. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Balu, as the family calls her. And yes. Sabrina, I want, I want you to comment on this, but I'm just going to play out just a little, a little clip where I thought it was quite clear that Senator Harris was embracing the Indian side of her just as much as she's embraced uh, the African-American side. And we'll just listen into this, and then I'll get your comment. My mother instilled in my sister Maya and me the values that would chart the course of our lives. She raised us to be proud, strong black women. And she raised us to know and be proud of our Indian heritage. She taught us to put family first, the family you're born into and the family you choose. Family is my husband, Doug, who I met on a blind date set up by my best friend. Family is our beautiful children, Cole and Ella, who call me Mamala. Family is my sister. Family is my best friend, my nieces, and my godchildren. Family is my uncles, my aunts, and my chitties. So, of course, the reference to Chitties really went viral here, uh, especially for those uh, in the south of India. But the, the allegation that you're constantly having to face a little bit of it, fake news, a little bit of it, maybe legitimate politics, that, that Senator Harris has always front footed herself as African American more than uh, Indian American, though she's, of course, a melting pot of both in the true American style. How, how does the campaign respond to that? Well, I don't think we need to respond to Eric Trump, um, but I think that uh, I think that you know we, I think you know to just taking a step back for for people that either you know hear about Senator Harris and and um, about her background. I mean, you know, she is a very proud, very very proud of of her heritage, very proud of the mother who raised um, you know her and her sister almost single handedly, and um, you know. She was born in the in the 1960s, where you know being a a woman, a, a biracial woman, was so you know it was still such a new concept um, during that time. Um, but you know at the time where Senator Harris grew up in um, in Oakland, um, in Berkeley more specifically, um, you know she was she was raised within a civil rights um, community, and that community was predominantly. Um, African American, and so, you know, her mother raised her and her sister Maya as proud Black women because, you know, also at the time they were protesting. I mean, I mean, literally, the senator talks about going to protest in a stroller. You know, Black Americans are still to to this day protesting for equal rights and, and equal treatment under the law, and so. By no means, you know, I, I don't think she neglects either side of her of her background. She is so proud of her heritage. Um, she talks about her mother constantly, um, and I know her mother is someone that inspires her. Um, whether it's uh, cooking or you know just in her life, um, you know, today just as 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 a woman, you know, running for office, that one of the highest offices in the land. Um, she is so close to her her family heritage and lineage that. Um, you know, I think she just she she brushes it off whenever she hears criticism because at the end of the day, it's about knowing 
who you are, knowing, you know, you have to be comfortable with who you are. And then, you know, the rest, I think America has really embraced her. Um, and, you know, the best thing about her is she looks like the America today. She looks, you know, there are so many more um, biracial men and women. Um, there are so many ways to now self-identify. And so um, I think she's really opened the door actually to just a larger conversation about um, how you talk about race in this country. And I think as someone said, uh, you know, being black uh, and, you know, and being African-American is much more central to the American civil rights movement than being Indian, which is not to say that people who are brown uh, have not uh, experienced racism. Right. I, rem I remember growing up as a as a kid in New York in the 70s, going to public school uh, when New York was very different from the city it is today. And I was, you know, my mother will, used to drop me, walk me to school in a sari and a bindi, and she used to get made fun of for wearing a bindi and a sari. Mm -hmm. And so we have come a long way from there. But of course, the Indian experience is not as central to the American argument over civil rights as the African-American experience is. So, you know, do you think people have understood that this is a multicultural candidate, this is a biracial candidate, or do you think that most people still see her as African American? No, you know, I think people do understand that she's a multicultural, multiracial candidate. I think people are certainly getting to know her more and more every day. Um, I mean, you know, being she she is also a graduate of Howard University, which, which I think is called the mecca for um, historical historically black colleges and universities. Um, she is she embraces that. She is some someone that is so proud, and I think she, she would be the only candidate um, if we were to win um, that would be you know the a vice president that came from an HBCU. Um, so I think you know it's really important to to remember here that like she's breaking these. These, these doors open and, you know, to, to quote, like shattering the glass ceiling really um, by making it possible for other people to say, hey, you know, I can do this too. I can run for office. But, you know, I think people are, are and I think Americans are really embracing her um, for, for who she is and um, her identity. And of course, if anyone has any doubts, you just have to see the Mindy Kaling uh, video uh, where I think it will be clear to anyone that there's no question of her uh, hiding uh, or diminishing the Indian uh, side to her ancestry. Uh, I do want to come exactly. in the end. I know, yeah, I know we have limited time with you. I want to come in the end very quickly to the politics, right? So we have uh, data that shows that 66% of Indian Americans back the Biden-Harris campaign. But there's been some argument uh, in India, especially maybe not so much there, about whether Democrats are tougher uh, on India's hardline politics than the Republicans. Uh, we have uh, Joe Biden, who earlier took a position on the new citizenship uh, legislation here. And we also had Senator Harris, uh, Sabrina, um, say this. This is much earlier. I just want to clarify, this is not on the campaign. This is earlier uh, in her capacity as a senator when she was asked about Kashmir um, and the abrogation of 370 and human rights. Uh, this is what she said. Well, as to the first piece, it is about reminding people that they are not alone and that that we are all watching. Mm -hmm. um, because so often when we see human rights abuses, whether they be in this country or around the world, um, the abuser will convince those that they abuse that nobody cares and that nobody's watching mm -hmm. and that nobody's paying attention, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is a tool of a, an abuser. And so that is part of what I would say. Um, we are watching. So, uh, you know, that comment got picked up a lot, uh, Sabrina, in uh, in the Indian media in particular. And there's been a lot of debate over whether uh, the Democrats would be tougher and would get more interfering, uh, as so to speak, in India's domestic politics. Uh, before you took on this position, there was a tweet of yours where you shared a New York Times article. I'm just going to pull that up also so you can respond to all of it together. And here you were quite critical of the Modi government. Again, I want to clarify, this was March. You were not speaking in your capacity as press secretary. This had nothing to do with the campaign. This was something you said much earlier, as did Senator Harris on Kashmir. But it raises the question of what a Democrat win or what a Kamala Harris win could mean for India. And, you know, when I was uh, talking to uh, to her uncle here, he was very blunt. He said, look, she's very proud of her Indian ancestry, but that doesn't mean she's going to change her mind about essential principles that she believes in. Uh, so just go ahead and take the politics of that on. 
Well, I think what her uncle said is is right. Um, I mean, look, you know, I think I think a Biden Harris administration would be would certainly be an ally to the Indian government. Um, I think, you know, you can go to JoeBiden.com and read more about our, you know, his foreign policy platform. I don't think that we are going to shy away from also holding, um, you know, governments and and people accountable. And I think, you know. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have said that time and time again on the campaign trail. I think, though, that you know a Biden Harris administration would be a would be a friend, would be an ally to India, would want to work with India on growth and economic opportunities. But also, you know, as the senator said, it's also you know making sure that um, if there are you know folks and and um, actions that need to be held accountable, that they are. But you know. I, I think also, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. We still have 16 days to win this thing. Um, and so, you know, we are we are really in, in the, the fight for the soul of our nation, I think. I truly believe that. Um, I don't know that <laughs> Donald Trump has really um, done much to advance our foreign policy platform in all countries at this point, because I, I don't think anyone can really trust what he has to say when um, it's foreign policy by tweet. So. You know, I hope that um, Indians, um, both in India and here in the U.S., see and and see an ally within um, a Biden Harris administration. See that we want to be partners to India um, and help with you know the prosperity of really all countries. Because at the end of the day, when when countries are thriving together, that makes for a stronger you know alliance. And so I I really am hopeful. Um, but before I get too ahead of ourselves, we still got to win. So we are <laughs> laser focused on, on um, November right now. Okay. Uh, finally, in the end, I know what matters to a lot of people is the very hard line position that the Trump administration has taken, even on work visas. There's so many Indians who come in on, on, on what are called H-1 visas. There's a sense that what your grandfather fought for is no longer possible uh, for, for people of my country and the country of your origin. What would you say to young Indians? I know they're very interested in hearing more about visa policies, about citizenship laws, and how much of a change uh, we could see on that front. Well, you know, as Senator Harris and Vice President Biden have said before, and I, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but diversity is our greatest strength. I mean, that is what makes our country great. When we embrace other ideas, when we embrace people from other countries, um, it can fabric of our nation just as much as the people that were born and raised here. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that a Biden-Harris administration is certainly gonna welcome more people back. We, you know, from what this administration has done from whether it was the Muslim ban to putting kids in cages and tearing their you know, children apart from their families, that is not going to be a Biden-Harris administration. We are going to welcome folks into the country. We are going to create pathways to citizenship. And most importantly, we know and we are going to embrace the diversity that people bring with them. Well, uh, good luck. I think perhaps this is the most important election in US history. And I know the world is invested in it, not just Indian Americans, but the world is invested in this. Sabrina Singh, uh, you are an achiever in your own right. You're the first Indian American to be appointed press secretary to a vice presidential nominee. Your grandfather fought for the rights of Indians in the US. Life does turn full circle. We wish you the best and we thank you for talking to us very much. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Thank you.